Hey, hi guys, welcome on the USS Slater. Uh, my name is Javier, I'll be your tour guide today. Uh, welcome to the quarter deck, which is where we are now. Uh, our first stop is going to be the galley, or the kitchen. But before that, I want to explain to you guys a little bit about the ship sure that uh, you may have not heard in the video. Uh, we are a cannon class destroyer too escort. High, too low. Uh, destroyer escorts during World War II, they performed the ever important task of protecting American merchant convoys that were headed to Europe, to places like the United Kingdom, North Africa, some Italy, France, and the USSR, uh, and in Japan, uh, securing American supply lines that, were, that was supplying the American war effort in the Far East. Now, in the Atlantic Ocean, the USS Slater escorted five convoys. Uh, these convoys consisted of very slow-moving merchant craft, uh, like freighters and cargo ships, tugboats, and transport vessels. Uh, many of the same freighters you'll see along the Hudson here, you know, size and speed, just very slow moving freighters that carry a lot of supplies and resources that were valuable to the war effort in Europe uh, that sometimes moved across the Atlantic Ocean at five miles an hour. And you can imagine doing that and being able to walk from the front to the back of your ship faster than the boats you were escorting could make the same distance. Now, uh, destroyer escorts in general, there are 563 of them made. They were really built to combat uh, the U-boat menace in the Atlantic Ocean. You know, by 1943, the German U-boats were sinking around three to five American ships a day in the Atlantic, which amounted to thousands of ships lost a year and tens of thousands of lives along with them. That was an enormous detriment to the war in Europe. And to stop that, the United States turned out almost 600 of these kinds of ships. And it was our job to protect our fleets against those U-boats. Now, by 1944, which was the year the USS Slater was commissioned into the U.S. Navy, the number of American ships being destroyed in the Atlantic went from three to five a day to, you know, like zero to one a week. I mean, it was an enormous change, and it was a huge shift in the dynamic of the war, because American supplies were being dropped off in Europe at significantly higher rates than they were before, and it allowed uh, big uh, events to happen in Europe, like the D-Day invasion. Uh, now, by 1945, the Germans had surrendered, and the USS Slater, having completed its fifth convoy mission, was shipped off to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, you know, the, the, the dynamic of the war was a little different. We weren't really fighting U-boats, we were mostly fighting aircraft. Uh, and the USS Slater, particularly, was going to take part in the mainland invasion of the Japanese islands. Now, in the Atlantic, destroyer escorts, they performed similar tasks to that, you know, escorting uh, ships, lighter vessels and transport ships onto the beaches in Normandy. Uh, that was a very important job that destroyer escorts did, you know, being able to, or, and destroyers did in general, being able to float on shallower waters and shell the interior to soften up defenses to allow American soldiers to land in. That was kind of going to be the job of the USS Slater in the uh, Japanese island. But that never happened. Uh, the Japanese surrendered well before any invasion took place. And uh, the U.S. Slater instead made me for Tokyo Harbor, which is where we performed occupational tasks in, you know, for about six months until late 1945, 1946. Uh, it was then that we were shipped off to the Philippines, where we did the same, um, and then we were sent back home in 1946 to basically be added to the Mothball fleet, which is a fleet of ships that are no longer kept by the U.S. Navy. Uh, and around the time of the Korean War, we were actually sent to Greece, and we stayed in Greece as the flagship of the Royal Atlantic Navy until the end of the Cold War. Uh, 1993 was exactly when we returned home to the United States. Now, we've been in the U.S. since 93, and we've been open for tours here in Albany since 1997. A uh, massive restoration effort was undertaken that really took around four years to complete, but it's still ongoing to this day. As we go on our journey around the ship, you'll notice a lot of different stations where volunteers are still actively working. Uh, they will stay here for very long hours, they'll make their food here, sometimes they'll sleep here. Uh, the ship is still very much alive and a lot of its faculties are still fully operational. So if you guys will follow me, unless anyone has any questions. How long does it take for one to cross? Is that that useful? Well, it really depends, because a lot of the times your trip wouldn't be back and forth. It would be escorting a convoy maybe to the Canary Islands, or maybe to the United maybe. Kingdom, uh, sitting around for a while and heading back, or it could be you know, escorting a convoy to one location, dropping them off, and then escorting a completely different convoy to another location. Um, 
in terms of going to like this length, this is a great shot there and back, then it really depended because you could have convoys that were moving at five miles an hour and you could have convoys that were moving, you know, at 10 to 15 miles an hour. So you could expect a minimum of being out to sea uh, for just you know, like three to four months. Uh, of, you know, minimum of being there. Um, it could be shorter, uh, and it could be a bit longer. But that's generally your average. All right, any other questions? Yeah. 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 Spud locker, is that potatoes? Yeah, it's potatoes. Keep potatoes out there? Yeah, yeah, there, there are a lot of them around the ship. Yeah. Everybody else? Hmm? That was a destroyer. I don't believe it was a destroyer escort. Uh, we're on a destroyer escort. It's a little smaller. Food in here? Not anymore. Bacon, egg, and cheese on a hard roll, please. A couple so java. Mm. What do they do with these things? This is for soups. That is a copper. Yeah, that's for rice stews. Nice. Yes, sir. Sure. It's gonna whip something up for us. Is there coffee in that coffee? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Keep an eye on Lisa. Is this the coffee pot okay. right here? No, that would be for the potatoes. That's yeah, how you kill them. Hot water would be channeled through the this is, right this here. This is it for 216 men? Uh -huh. Just this kitchen, huh? Yeah. And there'd yeah, be that's six, what I said. There would wow. be a crew of six uh -huh. cooks and bakers alike. That crew would work in shifts four. So you'd usually have you know, maybe three cooks and one baker. Yep. Overnight, you'd have more bakers and cooks or an equal amount at least, mm -hmm. you know, two to two, just to uh, be, you know, baking bread stuff throughout yep. the night. You'd bake hundreds of loaves of bread. Yep. Uh, but during the day, this place would be fully operational, making hundreds of portions for all the men for three meals a day, yep. including snacks and stuff and meals for the watchmen. We'd be out, uh, you know, make them around a third of the shift, and they'd be out, you know, 24-7. Um, especially throughout the night. Uh, so life in the kitchen is very difficult. Uh, having to prepare all those meals was no easy task. If you look around, you'll see some of the modern facilities you probably recognize from your home, like the stoves and hot services behind you above small ovens beneath them. Some things that I hope don't remind you of home. There's a big mixer here on my right. Some coppers, which you pointed out on my left. And the uh, interesting looking potato peeler, which is right here on my left as well. Now, ventilation was pretty rough and tough. There were two shafts up here, and then there was, of course, the hatch leading out to the O1 deck and the inner passageway here. Now, these two were your only ways out. Normally, on destroyer escorts, you wouldn't have this passageway. You only have the passageway out to the O1 deck. Uh, on most destroyer escorts built before 1943, your only way of getting food out was through this uh, Smells like an through the hatch track. here, going out to the O1 wow. deck, and that meant that whether it was snowing, or raining, or sleeting, or whatever, you had to get the food out through this way and carry it down to the mess deck. Um, we we're pretty uh, luxurious because we have the inner passageway, which saves the mess men and the stewards some uh, uh, some time having to go out there and bear the harsh weather conditions. Um, now, if it was raining, or if there were high seas outside, and you know you had waves splashing on board, you'd really want that door closed. And that's why you have 
this weird looking knee knocker here, and that was to prevent water from getting under the door when we shut it, is to make all of the areas watertight. Um, now, if any water did get in here, which is pretty common, you'd have a pretty hostile work environment because the ship would be listing back and forth. It'd be listing, and there'd be water on the floor. And you'd have to be moving around all the time because you'd have to go from station to station to cook. And it would be really hot and really steamy. And vision would be poor, and it'd be very, very hot. If I didn't already mention that, it'd be hot. You can imagine on a hot day, you could get, you know, like 80 degrees, 85 degrees. The sun is beating down on this tin, you know, this well, tin can. That's what they call them, tin cans, on this steel ship. Uh, on top of all the machines that are working here that are producing heat, it's it really, really hot. Uh, so, um, to give you an idea of what that would be like, like if you've ever been on a subway or a metro. When the subway starts, you kind of go flying back if you're not holding on to anything. And that's what it lists on a ship is kind of like. If that list, you know, if your ship hits a sharp wave and you're not holding on to something, you're going to fall and you're going to stumble. And when you're holding on to knives, when you're working with hot surfaces, when you're working with boiling water, that can be really dangerous. Life in the kitchen, no easy job. And when we weren't in the midst of a, a battle or anything, this is probably the most dangerous place to be on the ship by a long shot. Any questions I can answer? Cream sliced dry beef? Yeah, that's something they did. Are you thinking movies? Oh, I said I should have worn my dress and I would have left it. Thing in the back of your head, is that a pot scrubber? No, it's a funny hat rat. It's cute. It's sleeping though. Oh, I don't want to wake it up. We could have cooked it up a minute ago, but I don't want to wake it up. On there, I'll get your picture. Uh, well, there would be Everybody guys uh, Where uh, behind it, and one would be in charge of loading the ammunition, and uh, the other would be in charge of removing the um, shells, the brass shells, and then they'd shoot it. And then there'd be a guy having to handle the ammunition. And then there'd be guys over here setting the fuse for the ammunition. There'd be two guys loading the, I mean, uh, you know, training horizontally and vertically the gun, aiming it. And then there'd be a guy communicating with the I see the control center up in the bridge, um, basically just in charge of relaying the coordinates of where they needed to be. Because none of it would be done by eye, they'll just be done by numbers that they have to aim. If you did it by, you know, just like an eye test, you know, Yeah, because but yeah, it's 45 degrees um, is the longest range, right? So depending on how far you want it to go, how many shore you go up on it. So the two main things we were obviously concerned with as a destroyer escort is the perks of working under a bridge. Uh, but the two main things we're concerned with as a destroyer escort is protecting our convoy ship against enemy air attacks and enemy submarine attacks. We're not really concerned with other ships. Uh, it was very unlikely we were going to get in a, a scrap with another ship. Um, if that did happen, we were probably going to lose. Uh, we didn't really have a, a ton that could challenge uh, enemy battleships or uh, just enemy, uh, you know, uh, ships of the German or Japanese Navy. Um, so most of what we were going to deal with were U-boats and air attacks. And one of the ways we deal with medium to long range planes coming inbound uh, is with the range gun. This is our, our farthest shooting uh, anti-air weapon. Um, we shot around four and a half miles out. I don't know if you're familiar with the area at all, but that would be an equivalent to like Troy, New York or England to the university or the mall. Just put your hand on your um, I did that's not super that's far for a gun to shoot, uh, especially a long they're not they're, they're long not range. Right. I mean, you can probably cover four and a half miles in your car pretty fast. 
we're going at like 60 to 80 miles an hour. You can imagine a plane having zero obstacles to cover that distance, maybe even faster. Usually around seven to nine men. Uh, you would need a lot of men because you need to set the fuse of the weapon, you need to load the weapon, you need to clean the uh, kind of the debris and the brass shell that would pop out. Uh, you need people loading it, you need a communicator to talk to the people up in CIC and tell you where to shoot. The real, uh, you know, realistically, with the three inch gun, is you were gonna miss like 98% of the weapon. Um, you know, even you if said you missed, you missed around 99% of the time. How fast can you reload it? Uh, well, you shot every six seconds. Every this six is, seconds. This is, this is how they aim it right here, right? But much. it keeps them from moving forward because they're getting shot at almost. Uh, no, but he said you're using coordinates. 45 degrees up, 37 west, or something like that. Yeah. And you know, a, a, lot of math, a lot of math to go into it. Like, you need to calculate the velocity of the shell leaving the gun, the speed of the planes, the altitude of the planes, the speed of your own ship. Uh, a lot of calculations to go into it, and, you know, like landing like a rover on Mars, uh, the smallest little detail that you miss is going to result in a complete failure. And that was the reality of shooting a gun like this, was that they missed more than 99% of the time. Like, more than 99% of the time. So it was all about quantity of shells. It was all about how many shells could you shoot, and, like, eventually you're going to hit your target. And the only, you know, your only job banning this gun was just do some damage that the upcoming fight just make it a little easier. Just give your, give your fleet that much of an edge. Even if it's the slightest edge, give it even a really small edge and that sometimes will just be enough to win. So that's three inch gun. These are the hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are forward firing depth charges. Um, they don't act like the normal depth charges you see on the side of the ship. Uh, they act like contact oriented missiles or torpedoes or whatever you want to call them. They gotta hit something hard to explode. So you shoot them off the front of your ship and you're hopefully shooting them over a U-boat or submarine of some kind. You shoot them in this oval pattern, sort of like casting a net with your school of fish. Your goal is just to give the submarine or U-boat no room, no area to escape. And then the goal is just to hit them. And if you do hit them, you're definitely gonna sink them. Uh, there is a 100% success rate for these hitting their target. Um, the U-boat is going to sink them. They produced a really big explosion, and if you hit them with one, you probably hit them with multiple because they were shot in a cluster, obviously. Um, so they shoot right off that like that? Yeah, right off this right off this uh, platform here. Yeah, so what is, what is actually going into the red of um, I believe it's condensed air, uh, although all of this is electric. Um, basically all, all the controls, most of what you see on board is electric. A lot of the guns are controlled with a motor. Um, so that could have been the case a lot of the times as well. But what really you need to know is that they were aimed from right here, you know, this could sway to the left and the right, and they were shot from right here. Uh, so all of the uh, focusal, which is where we are now, by the way, is the deck we're on, it's called the focusal. We went from the 01 deck to the focusal on uh, the forward castle in the front. Uh, the the focusal will need to be clear, and then they can shoot the hedgehogs, and they shoot them right off the front. They shot them off the front and off nowhere else in the ship because the front of your ship is where you have the most information about what's in front of you. Uh, sonar only worked on a very small degree of everything in front of you, like 60 degrees of the things that were under the ocean in front of you. So since this needed to be accurate, since you needed to be precise with your shot, you wanted to be shooting it in the area to which you knew the most about. If you shot this off the side of your ship or behind the ship, you probably weren't going to do anything. Um, so you had a pretty good idea of what was going on in front of you with these, and that's where you shot. Can you tell us the, the 31 and the helmets, is that three inch gun. to the number of breach? Well, like, to the gun number or to the ship number? To the gun number. So okay. it's three inch gun, and it's the first three inch on the ship. Oh, okay. So 31. So the guys who are labeled 31, those are your family. That's going to be your crew for right. a long time. Okay. And then if you'll notice, this helmet over here on the side is a lot bigger. Uh, that's because he would be the one communicating with, uh, he would be the one with headphones on. Okay. He'd communicate with the bridge. So how many in a cluster? Shoot him up, James. Um, I mean, just as many as there are here. Um, so Where can I find comms? Uh, yeah, well, I'll shoot off the one. James, can I get a picture, buddy? Three, two, one. Cheese. Thank you. Yeah,
Can I open it? Alright, grab the hand. Definitely looks like Star Wars for sure. Three, two, one, bam. I went with. It's okay. Did Dad put one of them on? Did Dad put a helmet on? No. Did, did anybody get a picture of Chris sitting there? Chris sitting there with Dad in the background. You should right. sit on that. Why? What do you mean, why? You can get a picture of it? I think so. I'm uh, just checking out here. I'll catch up. Okay. You better catch up. Did it go this way? Where are we going? I think he's at all. All right. You and Ram boys just gotta touch everything, huh? <laughs> He had two less donuts this morning, so. <laughs> you kidding me? Them's the quarters. Them's the showers. Interesting place for a roll of toilet paper. Sorry. This guy's got a window. Yes. Oh man, this is the fancy dining room. Huh? See that? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Right away. See if it still works. We used to have one not like this but similar at my house when we were kids. Does it work? Try to call that one. Nine one one wasn't invented when that first came out. No, no, we lost, we lost Kim because um. Got to have uh, electricity to get that one going. Oh. Why did you do that? I was looking at it. I tried to put it back in its holder and I missed the bottom one. So. Oh, where'd she go? Over the side. Yep, she's she's floating. Yay! She went back to Sesh. Who'd we lose? Kim. Well, okay. welcome to Officer's Country. Um, this area would be off limits for the enlisted men and the normal men. Right now, we're in what was called the ward room. It would have a very country club feel. It's like you need, you know, a membership to be in here. You need to be an officer. Um, you would also need to be in uniform. You would need to follow a code of conduct. 
There would usually be music playing in here. There were a lot of books in here. It had a very stately, very academic feel to it. You can see the table was dressed pretty nicely. They had a scullery to themselves, where stewards would make them orange juice. They could prepare them very light meals, like a toast. Really not much else. Um, on top of that, the bunks, the dorms, they were pretty nice. Um, this was the lap of luxury on the ship, more or less. The captain's quarters were definitely nicer, but this was kind of separated from everything else, unlike the captain's quarters, which is really in the heart of the ship. Uh, this area, you know, you can see it, it, it it's pretty nice, uh, nicely situated between the forecastle and then we'll see the superstructure later on where all the action is. Um, so, like some of you pointed out, this area had a very important secondary purpose, and that was medical. You can see the surgeon lights right above the uh, table where the officers would eat. The surgeon would perform his uh, operations. What's that, that? What's what? This? The Kitchen. In here? The this would be called the scullery. And this would be where they would make coffee and, and orange juice. You can see this is uh, a little juice presser, presser here. And you can see uh, there's a dishwasher in there uh, and a toaster right there. Yeah, and it's like, and there, and the kids are get bored, they can play, they can play when they ate store. Yeah, 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 yeah they, they get bored, sure. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> the uh, surgeon, who wouldn't have really been a surgeon, would have been a pharmacist mate. Um, that's what his, uh, his rating would have been, a pharmacist mate. Uh, he would have had the training about an EMT. Not right now. I'm thirsty. <laughs> uh, he, um, he didn't have a lot of training, and uh, you know he was the only medical personnel on board. For all 216 men, there was nobody but him. Now he did have an assistant, and that assistant kind of guided him through the operations he needed to undertake. Um, whatever kind of operation it was, if it needed to be done, he did it sort of like you might assemble an IKEA table or put together a Lego set did it with a lot of instructions. And his assistant would kind of read him the instructions off as he performed the operation. Um, there were ships, larger ships, or flagships in a convoy that had proper surgeons and had proper doctors and physicians. But, you know, uh, it's very hard to get an injured person from one ship to another at sea when you're in two moving vessels over the ocean. Um, so if it was something that was urgent, you needed to do it here. And, you know, you needed to do it with the resources you have. And our main resource was the pharmacist's mate. You can see in pictures of his locker right there. This was his medical bag. He would sanitize his equipment in that boiler right there in the corner, the same place where the officers would spoil their lobsters or their crabs or whatever else they would be eating that night. Ew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely, yeah. That definitely don't want to get dirt on the ship. You. Um, so... The uh, wardroom in every destroyer escort usually features two very important things. The map of where the ship has been. You can see that right there on that cabling. Uh, and a picture of the namesake. Ours is Frank Slater. Frank Slater died in the Battle of Guadalcanal. He was awarded the Naval Cross, which is the highest medal the U.S. Navy can give. And he was given the namesake of this ship here in Albany, the USS Slater, built in Tampa Bay, Florida. Uh, not far from where he was born in Pike, Alabama. Uh, for his heroism. Um, now, he died in battle. His mother would christen the USS Slater with a bottle of champagne full of water from well that he dug in their family farm back in Fife, Alabama. They were tenant farmers, like a lot of people who uh, served in uh, Navy in World War II. They were, he was really a, a child of the Great Depression era. And he was very, very young. He was 22, which, ironically enough, would have been considered pretty old for uh, a soldier or a Navy man in World War II. Um, the men who served as officers in this area right here were in, they would have been the oldest on the ship, and they usually would have been, been between the ages of around 20, 21. Oh um, that generally would have been their age. Uh, so what do you think, Andrew, Arthur, Hannah? Ready to go? Go oh, Navy! <laughs> uh, a ship being run by a group of 21 year olds. That's exactly what you would imagine a ship being run by a group of 21 year old boys was like. Um, so we can head right out here. We're going to go and see where the enlisted men lived. One floor beneath us. This is going to be our first ladder. So be careful. Hold on. Hold on. Wait for dad. Where's mama? She's home. Where are you? 
This is like a ride. <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, that's a french fry press. Turn around if you want. Yeah, that's Turn a good idea, bus. James. Mm. Give us more. There you go. Use this way, see what's over here. Let's go down this way, Mike. I think I can hear them over there. Yep. Oh, that's pretty modern. Those are fancy shoes for being on a ship. Uh, yeah, they were non slick shoes. Yeah. So you would slick it. Yeah. They just don't look it though. You know, they look more like dressing. Yeah. 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 Yeah
not a ton, but actually a, a pretty respectable amount. You can see, like right there is where uh, air would be brought in from the outside. Uh, I can't notice another one in here, but basically how it would have worked is they would have sucked air from the 01 and 02 decks and they would have just kind of like sprayed it in here. And that's how they would have kept the air moving. Um, obviously that worked better some days than others and the air could have gotten quite stale. Um, you know, this, we're on a deck that's really, um, uh, has a lot of access to the outside. Um, there were other decks, though, where people slept that had a lot more beds in them and were a lot more shut in. Um, right. so this one was definitely more than this, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Hey, stop running around so much, James. All right, so this that's is, true. uh, a living area for... 33 crewmen. There are 33 bunks in here. Um, top, middle, bottom. There was no hierarchy to the bunks. It was completely random. However, you could bunk. What was that? You could bunk all you want. You take any your first class. You could bunk in there. You could take whatever rank you wanted. There you go. Second class could take whatever and down. So how many first class people would uh, be in here? Do you think? Oh, in here? Yeah. Maybe you have three or four. Okay. So, it's your first class, you can choose your bunk. Um, for everyone else, there was a favorite bunk, although you didn't get to choose it. Anybody guess? Maybe you already know what that favorite bunk was? I always took the top one. Why'd you take that? Over in the corner, because it was nice and quiet and peaceful there. And then I got that after I got to the second class. I started taking that. I think top also. Top? Why top? Um, although, hot air rises? I think uh, at least maybe you're above the foray of whatever's going on under you. It's a really good reason to take top. Um, <laughs> I did take a bottom one. And vomiting. And the tool came back drunk one night and set my shirt on fire. And the smoke came up and bellowed in my face. <laughs> and I woke up just before I was going to die. Yeah. What the hell? The whole place was smoke. And he's laying there with a cigarette in his hand right on my shirt. <laughs> Passed out. Oh I took the shirt and put it out, but uh, I came close to dying that night. I never, I never even wrote him up for doing that because the guy was 14 years in the Navy. He was in all during the Second yeah. World War, and he was just a bad drunk. He probably would have gotten quite a bit of trouble. And uh, he would have got, he would have got thrown out of there. He was on his the last leg. Everybody was thrown out. Well, yeah. the foray of what was going on around you could have been people vomiting on you. Yeah. It could have been. Just people coming in and having to lift you up to access their stuff. Yep. You know, on, on yeah. modern destroyers, you have separate lockers that people can yeah. go up and access their stuff in separate lockers, like that one in the corner there. On destroyer escorts in World War II, you had the lockers beneath the bottom bunk, which meant that if you had to get up to go to your lock, they got one, out. They got one over there that's set. Sleeping. I'm gonna see how that bunk is lifted. Up, you're lifted. Get your uniform and stuff. And then go to your job. Uh, yeah. How, are we under a bar right now? Um, yeah, more or less. Yeah. The water level is like hits the hits the, our our, our uh, side of the ship here. Um, good question. Yeah. Yeah. This, by the way, from um, in front of you to behind me, this is really as wide as the ship's gonna get. Uh, it gets a little wider, you know. It gets around you know 30, 35 feet, but this is it. It is tight. Um, 216 men. This is very, very tight. Uh, so, you know, top bunk was preferred, uh, especially because most of the men who served in the Navy in World War II didn't really, have, they, they did not know what life was like in a boat. Most of them had never been in a boat. Most of them did not have to swim when they first joined. So, seasickness was pretty common. Yeah, and that was why I voted top. A lot of, you know, people were thrown up over the side often. Uh, and that was that was pretty brutal to be a part of as a bottom bunk. <laughs> All right, any questions while we're here? Let's get the tight down here. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, excellent. Can we go to the top? I don't know. We'll see. What are they working on? This says work in progress, doesn't say what. Here's where they have a thing lifted, I think, for a locker space. Oh, yeah, yeah, I looked in there. Oh, sewing machine in there. You put plastic over it? 
So their little display, yeah. their little brush for your shaving cream shaving and shaving never, kit. Probably never that neat though. <laughs> probably slushed My dad had a hat like that. Well, they did. I mean, it probably was that neat, right? It's worth. Well, they There's did inspections, inspections, I would imagine. Man, you'd hear the smell the bread, the bacon. You think they cook bacon? They were or do you lucky. Think they probably had like hard tack. Maybe tuna bacon, tuna, tuna skin. Hard tack. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right on the guy's head. Is it already like just the dust and everything gets you? No, it's totally clean. Wow. I guess, uh, imagine if you were a tall person, like six foot or something. Oh, yeah. I almost just like hit my head a second ago. 70 times a day, you probably hit your head. For lightning? Please see your glasses. Oh, thank you. I heard it. Thank you. You're welcome. That's your lightning rods? Yeah. That's crazy. And that's how they powered the ship? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so um, we're going to head into this tube structure next. But since we're such a large group, I'm going to explain the community and then I'll kind of stand aside and let you guys go in and explore. And if there's anything you have a question about, right there, uh, answer any questions. So, uh, in the superstructure to the left is the radio center. Yeah, port side. Port side? Port side. All right, we'll stick, we'll stick, to, we'll stick to nautical terms. Uh, so, uh, in the superstructure on the port side, immediately, you're going to see the radio center. Uh, radio central is used for passive communication, mostly hearing orders from your headquarters. Uh, we wouldn't use Radio Central to communicate with ships around us. We really wouldn't send any radio messages at all. We would use it for uh, listening. Now, the reason for that is if I send out a radio message, my location can be pinpointed fairly easily by anybody around us because you can't filter out radio messages. You know, I, I can't prevent another radio room from overhearing what we're sending. I can only prevent them from really understanding what we're sending by uh, encoding it in some kind of crypto code. So the only reason we'd send out a radio message is if something was really, really urgent or if we'd already been spotted. So we would hear our headquarters, we would hear our orders from our headquarters. There would be uh, typewriters in there with typists who rapidly write down what we were hearing. Uh, you'll hear a Morse code in there. Uh, they'd be writing down what that Morse code was, uh, which was encrypted and the American clock signal, which was the code the U.S. used in World War II. Uh, and then a communications officer would sort of translate it and send it up to his officers, who would be two decks above him in a flying bridge. And then that's how they would relay their orders around the ship. Um, straight ahead in there, down that passageway, you're going to see the yeoman's office. Uh, the yeoman's office, he would have been like the administrative guy on board. Uh, to you as a sailor, really the only two things you cared about that he did was he was in charge of the Liberty, which was your permission to leave the ship if you were docked in a foreign shore, and your pay. You got paid around $60 a month. There was no checks involved. It was all cash or it was nothing. So it was cash or it was an IOU from the U.S. Uh, that you got eventually. Uh, and then the last thing in there that you're going to see is the captain's quarters. The captain's quarters are the nicest tour area on board. Um, you know, he's got his own bed, he got his own bathroom, he's the only guy in the ship his own bathroom. Um, you can see a picture of his uh, wife and his daughter on his desk. Oh, not in the bathroom. Not in the bathroom. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then next we're going to head up and we're going to see CIC and we're going to see the pilot house where they steer the ship and we're going to see the signal bridge. So, the only on this ship would take care of the leave too. What was that? The leave. I mean, you took leave? Yeah, yes. The yeoman would take, take care of that too. So you can follow me in here, and I'll stand to the right. You guys can explore yourself. No trip. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, everybody. Go. Go down a little bit. Communications. Radio Central. Radio Central. Post That's a lot of radios. That's a lot of different radios. Why do they need so many radios? 
uh, uh, set the different stations or something? Different uh, frequencies? Um, well, the... Sometimes, um, a lot of it was just because accomplishing simple communication back then needed a lot more equipment than we do now. And probably skin multiple channels. Yeah. Right? Uh, would, this would, would this be a common setup with all these radios? It would be fairly common. Yeah, that many. And is this one over here newer or is that your heater? What's that thing right there? We're going to go up this way. Okay. What's the thing with the big two uh, levers on it? Two red levers. Is that the, another uh, radio? That's fuse. That's yeah. Uh, that's power. That's power. Right? Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Oh, it says radar equipment on it. Are you looking at? Because there's one right here, and then there's the first one with the copper on the top. With the nice switch. It says uh, radar. Uh, radar transmitter. Yes. Let's go yellow. I don't know how you read that. I need new glasses, maybe. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, this is just a radar transmitter. Um, so it's just a part of the radar equipment. Uh, we'll see kind of what it's connected to, actually. It's connected to something that is directly above us. Yeah. Um, we'll see that when we go upstairs. Gotcha. Yeah. Pretty cool. This is just a switchboard over here. This is what I thought you were talking about. This just turns on everything. Now it's a power board. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it says it too. Power panel. Remember, a bunch of 21-year-olds. You got to keep it spelled out. Take Kim's spot. Where are we going? What's up here? This is where that guy that gives you lead hangs out? I'm not sure about output. That one where they were just like uh, lightning rods. That was lightning rods. They, yeah, I'm not sure what they did with the electricity that they got from the lightning, but that's all they were. I wonder what the difference is between the gold and the gray phone. I didn't go any further than the board with the lobby. Yeah, we're going. Or they're going to close the ship. Yeah. 20 years old. It's not his mama. We're going. Eventually, we're going up. What's up? Well, this is the captain. You see the girl? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Going up again? I don't know. Whatever this young man tells us. We're going up. Is that the. Uh... If you want to see the captain's quarters and stuff, that's I did. What... I did. And then. All right. Come on. That's exactly where they came from. I didn't. Yeah. Let's go on, James. You having fun, buddy? This is the guy. He's got the maps and the radar, and he's uh, helping to direct where the boat's going to go. And that looks like a flare gun. What the heck, Papa? You didn't just jump up here like me? No, no. You gotta wipe our hand sandwich. It's infected. Yes, definitely. Don't something? touch your nose then. Yeah, right there. And I always do. So, Father, oh. we're right here. They're right okay, there. Awesome. And then, blah. Jamie? Right here. Yeah. Okay. Radar's still working. What's all of that? What's that? It's got to show you the direction you're facing and what's out there. Yeah, but what is that thing that's in front? I don't know. It's radar. I don't know how to read it. Do I look like a... This is awesome. Could it be the landmass to the right of us? To the left of us? This is where they put you. True bearing. Relative bearing. Okay, we found Bearing indicator. Yes. You guys can... Filter it out of there, and whenever you're done, I'll be in the pilot house right here. Let's go to the pilot house. Okay. A little fan action. Uh, what do you think, Charter. Bill? Can you read Charter. this? Can you tell me what's showing up on the uh, radar? Sure. Land. 
I think it's Dustin. Dustin's here? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. you can see his shape. Oh yeah, it's Could him right there on face. the deck. Yeah, Dad. You can see him. No, oh, he's teasing. And it's probably off the front of the boat. Probably oriented so that that's the front of the boat. This one's the sides right? that's behind oh, yeah. us. And this is probably all this. Can you see anything in there? Or did he get no. here on the side of the boat? Nothing. Towards the front. Uh, 20 degrees. Zero was up, right? 240, so that's... Godzilla! That's... that's... Zero. Ah, <laughs> oh, it's Godzilla! It's a party! Did someone just say Godzilla? It's a party? Godzilla. He goes, it's Godzilla! <laughs> Did you watch Kong vs. Godzilla? Yeah, we gotta watch it again. I only saw it once. Well, it's party in there because there's a red light. <laughs> Said I can't call my mother. Now this is the place to be. In the captain's quarters, one gray phone, one gold. The difference between the two? Uh, the two phones could connect to two different areas. So. One usually connects to places like the engine room um, and areas down there, whereas the other will connect to areas like the ward room, the pilot house, or the CIC. But um, yeah, he would have a big port of buttons that he would have the option to pick from, and he'd just have to know, okay, which phone do I need for which part of the ship, and then I right. click button. And then so the gold one's not the bat phone, huh? No. <laughs> so if he's in here, he, he talks Dr. Seuss way. Sound travels. Dr. If, if, yeah. How are you doing up there? No, I mean, yeah, it comes out here. Oh. There, on a different part of the ship, it comes out here. You gotta talk in there. So you don't have to worry about electronics at least. If you're in here, yeah, you just yell through the tubes, and that's how you communicate with the people by there and around you. See? So, uh, this is the pilot house. Um, these tubes. You see, they were in CIC too. So, if you saw the radar thing in CIC, that was that was what was connected to the transmitter in the, in the radio central. And then, this is just a radar repeater. So, this just repeats uh, what's happening in there. Um, so, this is the pilot house. The pilot house is where they steered the ship from. You can see where the pilot would have stood right there on his nice little wood board to prevent him from slipping in case water got in the pilot house. This is an engine order telegraph. This would have how this is how you would have communicated with your engine room. Uh, there. Ching ching. Yeah. Four knots. <laughs> exactly right. There would have been a, a, a light in the engine room that would have flickered on uh, depending on where I put my um, levers here. Um, so if I put them at two thirds speed, oh. there would have been a light in the engine room on a big switchboard that would have lit up on two thirds speed. And that's how they would have known how to get the engine going at one speed. So they don't actually so control the engine from here. They yeah. send a signal to tell them what so to. So this is reverse. What to do? And this is forward. Two thirds speed was really those indicators for how much um, fuel to so sort of fire it with. Not the fuel, the throttle. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, we were okay. a diesel electric engine. So uh, okay. Fuel efficient. Uh, today, maybe we consider it like a hybrid. Not coal. Not coal. <laughs> that would have made for a I mean, That would have been the Titanic. Yeah. yeah, probably. So probably. you can see the compasses they would have used to navigate. This is a magnetic compass. This is a gyroscope. They would have used a gyroscope to navigate. Um, and then this is the chronometer that measures the list of the ship. How much the ship is going back and forth with the waves. Whether the water is going to flow out of your shower or not. Yeah. Uh, anything above really 70 is considered really the point of no return. That's when you have to abandon your ship. That's wow. when the ship is going to flip. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. All right, any questions? Uh, no, sir. All right. And is that out. what those things are that are hanging, the ropes that are hanging um, on the side of the ship there? They were like ladders or this something like that? Like yeah, if I turn this, I'm turning the rudder. Down on the it's a left and a right yeah. rudder. Yeah. Hanging off is the side. Yes, yeah, so I ladders. do believe so. They look like rope ladders. Yeah, come with yeah I mean, there were plenty of those to get people on board. Yeah, there, there were plenty of those. Um, I think I know what's going on. But, oh. Is this one of Chris? Is that the one you want to fire, Mike? Go ahead and put your shoulders on there. 
swing it around so I can see the front of it a little more. Go to your right. Three, two, one, fire. Three, two, one, fire. You just make believe, silly man. Why don't you put the helmet on? What's up, buddy? This is another big spotlight. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, Let's put this with your hands because we've been touching a lot of things. But uh, normally we have them up and they would say mostly, for most things, they just say our name. Is that, is that the flag box? Is that the flag box? Yeah. Gotcha. Alright, we're gonna head right downstairs. Nice to go to that. Get in front of me and we'll go down too. Yep. Where? <laughs> Hand the guns. Drop the charges. Yo, 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 what is that thing? That's a gun. Those are the shells, but they have concrete in it, so you can tell it doesn't fire any longer. Because we're in a port of Albany. Why? You think it would destroy a lot of things? Potentially, yeah. Definitely. They're both two different size shells, it looks like, so I don't know if they both fit in, would fit in there. It's just an example. Hannah, can you see now why you couldn't see down the barrel of that gun you were looking down? Look, they have concrete in the end of it. You couldn't meet where you put the, the, the bullet in or whatever. It's like blocked off. Look how heavy these are without the ammo. And uh, ancient Roman ships wouldn't have these Carthaginian ships would. And when the Romans captured a Carthaginian ship, they discovered why they kept losing it. And that's because the Carthaginians built their ships in Carthage. And those parts were dead. Because even a steel ship, it hits a sharp wave and it's one big part and it'll snap. Father, yes. Our ship yes. will snap in half. Okay. Now the welding on board looks like it's done by a bad surgeon. It's really cheap welding and it's really cheap steel. Uh, it, it's a really cheap ship. That's why they call it tin. Yeah, they call it tin cans. Uh, and it, it, it was easily damaged. Uh, and it was damaged in storms, uh, you know, it was damaged by tempests and uh, just Sailing was something you needed a crew to always uh, be working on this ship uh, throughout the 1940s during our time at sea. You'd always need a skilled crew to be keeping up with repairs because we would take on a lot of damage all the time throughout our time, uh, throughout our journey across the Atlantic Ocean. We're going to head down to the 40s or something. I never understand how you tell um, what side is the starboard side. What side? One's right or one's, one's left? It's red. The right side. Wait, 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 say that again. <laughs> port side is the left side. Port line is red. So it's red. Uh huh. And the left side 
because there's never any left? There's never any quartz left. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do you remember it? That it's left. Quartz the left. Start, there's no line left. So it's just opposite that. of quartz. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why did you say it's red? Oh, just I thought it there was like lighting or something. What is that? What size gun is that? It's a 40 millimeter. 40 mil. 40 mil. It's called a buffer. The, okay, the controls on it, they, they still work quite well. They're a lot smoother than the 3 inch gun. The weapon was really quality uh, and it's really reflected in its status today as probably our our nicest looking and feeling weapons on board. And it looks like they have it limited so it can't come back and shoot the, their own ship. Like the other yeah, one there, yeah. I noticed it had stops on it. Yeah. It's like, oh, that's uh, smart. And this is the one that you can really see the motor. Uh, this is the big motor. You can see the two exhaust pipes here. the motor for what? Gas? Gun would be controlled mechanically from these posts up here. Electric though, right? Yeah, all electric. And these guys are yeah. about eight guys working on these two positions. You would shoot the gun, the left hand uh, uh, trainer would shoot the gun with the pedal. You can see the pedal on the left side moves up and down. Yeah. And that's how you shoot it. That's the trigger. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool, huh? Kick out the jams. Brothers and sisters. Every minute. And that meant that it shot a lot. The water cooling was very important. The 20 millimeter, you would physically remove the barrel to water cool it, and you dip it in a, 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 a nice bucket of water, cool it off. Uh, this water cooling would be more of an active process. You can see the recoil right here. You know, these, this spring was the recoil. Um, but this whole barrel would need to be cool. So you'd see like something like this um, filled with water to cool it off. You know, salt like, water, wouldn't that corrode it? Oh, what was that? Would they use salt water? Yes, yeah, yeah. They always they use salt water to, um, uh, well, I mean, it's like salt water you normally wouldn't want to use because of its reaction with the uh, steel. Right, um, right. But fresh water, when fresh water was a commodity, you know, when it was a commodity on board yeah. the ship, right. you wouldn't want to waste it. So if you were scarce on fresh water, you'd right. have to use salt water. Either that or it looks like something's flowing in. Mm. Yeah, well, whatever it's doing, it's moving out. Yeah. It could be the tide. Right? Could be. Tide's leaving. You have to see me on that phone. You? Yeah. I just tripped up. Crazy. No, there's no gunpowder in them. No, these pieces. Just for show. These are just plastic things. Yeah. Probably in lead or steel, right? They're probably steel. I think it goes the other way. The tips go down and then. Yeah. Okay, I'm away. What's this for? Bring people on and off the ship? That's an iron maiden. I don't even get to see this puppy over here. Okay. He'll let us look around a little bit. We'll come back. What's up with you? I gotta see what he's got to say and then we'll wander. Depth charges.
I saw the guy in the video. Get it to us 45 feet. This, gun, this ship has a lot of guns. It does. Yeah. Um, okay. Especially this even just compared to other museum ships. How many guns on all, all in all? 50, 50 feet. Oh, I'm not sure exactly how many all in all. Um, on all the, in the whole ship? There are three three inch guns. Uh, there are three 40s. And then I think there are seven 20 millimeters. Seven and six. That is a thirteen. Three you are right. The square of course, normally you'll see five inches. Yeah, it has a five inch on the fish. A lot of them, like the USS Slater, they were built with three inches. Yeah. And you know that is just smaller version. So our depth charges over here. Depth charges over here. Depth charges. Go to ask questions later. <laughs> the depth charges. They were the premier defense against the boats. They'd be shot off the side of the ship, off of these things. They're called K guns. They'd be loaded with black powder and they would launch the depth charges off the side of the vessel. The depth charges would sink to an approximate depth that you would be in charge of setting. That would be aimed at, you know, reaching the depth of where the submarine was and then they would detonate based on the pressure of the ocean. At each, at, at around 33 feet of uh, water, you know, at every 33 feet, the water pressure increases. And you can feel that. If you go diving, you can feel it in your head. And on the rest of your body, you need to feel it pressing down on you. You get a headache or your ears are pop. Well, the depth charges, they feel that just the same way. And the deeper they go, the more water pressure they feel. And their trigger is designed to respond to water pressure. So you set the trigger to however deep you want it to go off. And at that depth, that trigger is then going to respond to how much water pressure exists at that depth. And uh, it's going to force the trigger to go inward, and then it's going to detonate the explosion. It has around 300 pounds of TNT inside of them, which is a really big explosion. U-boat uh, does not have a lot of steel protecting it, just like, just like us. Uh, so one of these exploding near it will do a lot of damage, and one of these exploding around it will still do a, a really good amount of damage. And, uh, you know, damaging a U-boat compromises its oxygen supply, and that's just your goal, is just to poke holes in it to just disrupt its oxygen and then it's forced to come up to get oxygen, and that's when you do it. Uh, one of the main ways, or one of the, yeah, one of the main ways they destroy you boats once it's surfaced with these ships is they just ram into them. You just make full speed ahead to it, and you just try to split it. Uh, that would be a, a really, really common uh, procedure. You two depth charges, and then you go full speed ahead. Uh, trading, or at least, you know, taking on damage to destroy you will, that was a big deal. Uh, even if you did a lot of damage to your ship, that was still just a big deal. Because the so U-boats, they were really quality, so they were kind of like few and far apart in terms of how frequent you see one. Uh, and once you got an opportunity to kill one, you would take it. Uh, Destroyer escorts, they were a dime a dozen. You know, they were 600, 563 in all. U-boats um, were around 59. You know, it was, it was very, a very unproportioned effort. It was, for every U-boat there was, there were 10 destroyer escorts. What was the ratio, though, of how many U-boats were destroyed? I'm not sure about that. Uh, or the percentage. By, the, by the end of the war, it really wasn't even about destroying the U-boats. It came to the point where the U-boats just didn't have fuel to run. Uh, I will say U-boats, they were daring. They would, U-boats would, They could go really deep too. They could go so deep that they debate made American sonar, and that's what made them so crazy. What's right. up with that wrench behind my brother? Yeah, like a flip-flop rifle. You know how you put black powder in, uh, and then the one of them. Did you bring any uh, stuff in here? Oh, we have like some on the way out. Same stuff we used on the way in. I didn't see any. That wrench is how you steer the ship if our pilot house goes down. What? So if our pilot house yep. is destroyed, you, yeah, you get pick up the wrench and then you, you steer the 
uh, there's a backup uh, steering wheel back here, and that's how you. Is that like it moves a rudder? Like a rudder? Yeah. Oh my god! Just like the old Viking ships. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So that is tough. Where does that hook up? No, I'd say no. i say not. This is the back, you're not just with the front. No, this is the back. Here, so it'd have to be back here. Maybe. Actually, yeah. Maybe it used to be there. They might have capped it. I don't know why it thought it was still up here, but yeah, it used to be. Maybe it has something to do with this. Perhaps. That's how you probably tow another boat. You'd probably hook onto that and throw it out where the line is. Yeah, that sounds Okay. Okay. Nice little gaff. Yeah. Gaff you gaff all overboard. We got everybody? Where's Sophia? There she is. What's in here, Mikey? If you want to see the engine from this ship, uh, it's a separate tour. Uh, oh, so yeah, they're working on a second engine room, on the second engine room right now. You remember this ship? couple of years. Didn't look like this. Yeah, You'll need it. biceps to get into them. Yeah, it's got that smell. Put the birthday boy in the middle. You can hold the bell. Here on the head with me. Yeah, right up here. Sit right here on this. Yeah, right up here. 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 Oh, yeah. Once it shoots up, yeah, I heard you got to actually done. replace it. That's, that's really nice. So once you're done and you get resupplied, not only do they give you five, they give you five cradles. You're like, there's not enough crates for things. Five, ten, fifteen, thirty. And if they have anything on there. All right, coming. I kept the cash. It's, a, it's like a trough. Gas masks. What's, what's this cute? Ah, it's Popeye. <gasps> Popeye the Sailor Man. Ah, that's your commode. Yeah. Urinals. Commode. Not good. I mean, it was just a spread. 
to sure. the bathroom. And, sure. it was, right. and it was really, really bad in there. And then what people would do to you if you did stay in there for too long is they would make a little boat out of paper with a light on fire and they just put it under you. Oh boy. And they would put it from on like the left side of the trough and then they would just you you had, you, you had this long. Yeah. And the showers are the same way. You got three minutes of shower for three days a week. Awesome. So um, why is the one red in there and the one oh, seat? He scared me. That is what for is he doing in there? With, oh, that's his pee pee room? That's where they go poo poo? Oh. You got an STD, you use the red one. No STD, you use the ones on the left. Oh Popeye obviously does not have yeah. an STD. The red one's for the people with the SI STDs. Where'd Jamie right. go? Yeah, I mean, that was not something you were really ashamed of. Um, that, but, you know, that was really the, one of the only precautions that they took um, was in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, those were definitely, you know, don't drop the bar of soap. Yeah, and, you know, it's like... No, there's not an open shower, though. Oh, oh yeah, the showers are... Uh, funny enough, they're, yeah, they're not open. They're just private. Yeah, but, you know... Hey, what you doing? <laughs> you hungry? <laughs> hungry. Want a sandwich? Water still works. Other than that, you got some nice new piping. Area where you shave, where you brush What are you doing? You're like, so what? 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 You're saying, what? What? The Ma last male humor. Is, uh, engineer so funny. Right here. Mm. It has me dying when I show every time. And and what? Yep, yeah, man, it's stuck at 14 for life. Yep. Hey, that's not such a bad age. No, it was all good. My skateboarding days. Wow. Swimming, skateboarding. Jesus Christ, dude. It's shining through my eyelids. Yeah. You don't like that, do you? <laughs> Yep. Okay, I call the red seat, Dad. Okay, the red one? Yeah. All right. Michael. I'm getting the... Let's take a dump. Come on, you guys sit down there, take a turret, I'll get the picture. Yeah. Here, I'll take the middle. Andrew can have the right. Just unhook it. Oh, well done. Good. All right, you got the middle, Michael. Grab a piece of toilet paper, pass it over to Arthur. Andrew, sorry. OTP. What was it, three squares? Three squares, that's all you got. Three, two, one, Sh holy schmoly. <laughs> all right, maybe I should have stood up and taken care of this. Break this? Yeah. Dorothy, you're no longer in Kansas. What did you say? So Dorothy, you're no longer <laughs> in Kansas. Guess not. There's some uh, Germex if you want some. Use it on your hands. You want me to pump, pump it? Well, you gotta put your hand like right underneath it, like that. What's up with this room? Engineer's office. What is it? Engineers? Yeah, this will be your office, huh? There's just glass in there. So. So the guy that knew how to fix the ship would hang out here, huh? He's also got a defibrillator for some reason. Yeah, I think that's more modern. Be careful. Come on, pay up. Ship service store. I need a pack of cigarettes. I'm going to. Uh, nice job. Go Thank you. That was the common one. mission. I saw that one earlier. I saw that one, Mikey. Uh, 
That must have been the one he was talking about. Up here is the flying bridge. If the officer is the captain, he would be behind this area. Yeah. One deck above us. Does the tour go up there or no? No, we can't take it up there because you, uh, the ladder hasn't been refitted yet. Gotcha. So it's too, the insurance doesn't allow us to take people up there yet. Understandable. Yeah. All right. What are they store in those containers? So, uh, water cooling, you would just have that full of water. And you put the barrel in there to cool it. And then there'd be fresh barrels. Usually you'd have two. I'm not sure why there's like one there. But the fresh barrel would be over here. Cool. So these would shoot like 450 times a minute. They shoot so fast that you need to change the barrels pretty often or else they melt and explode. Gotcha. Uh, the magazines would also they only hold 60 each they need to be changed three times a minute so six each right uh, so you know changing the barrel once a minute changing each magazine six times a minute you know you're talking about like a nascar level pick crew type of work minute. right while there are planes going. i bet you they were blowing at night when they were firing them yeah, yeah i bet cool crazy love to see them firing them but glad we're not at war What's up, Mary? Dustin has a lighter. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear dad. Happy birthday to you. Use the lid, Willie. Give him the block. I don't know which way the wind's coming from. Oh, yeah. I think it's definitely coming from the water. Right. From the water. All right, All right. imaginary blow oh, can He's, He's got, got one. <laughs> Yay! 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 Okay. Yay. These are egg free. These are gluten free. These are regular.